This is Annabelle Caputi and you are listening to Lawfully Creative, my podcast to talk with professionals in the creative industries, to hear their stories, what inspires their creation, what decisions change their careers, what relationships influence their work. Today's episode is brought to you by Crefovi, our London and Paris-based law firm focused on advising the creative industries. Subscribe to our podcast Lawfully Creative or catch up with our original shows on iTunes, Spotify, Deezer, Stitcher, YouTube, Anchor and many more podcast aggregators and platforms. Please do leave a review and rating about our podcast to encourage others to discover our curated content. Thank you. So I'm in Brighton um, and I'm sitting next to Stella Bagot, who is the founder and managing director of Atelier Stella Ceramics, um, based and located in Brighton as well. Yeah, I'm delighted to be here. It's a lovely uh, 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 Saturday afternoon in May in Brighton and people are very chillaxed and uh, keep you looking in the streets <laughs> and uh, everybody seems to have a good time in Brighton. So, hello Stella. Hello. Um, would you like to introduce yourself to our... Yeah, so I'm Stella. I um, make ceramics. Nearly all of my ceramics have faces, so they're quite easy to tell what they are. Um, I've been making ceramics as Atelier Stella for seven years now, mm-hmm. um, although I was doing ceramics sort of as a part-time hobby before. Um, whilst I used to be a children's book illustrator, but now I'm pretty much full-time ceramics. Yeah. So you, you, you started your business in 2012? Yeah, I think it was then. I, um, How interesting, I also founded my law firm in 2012, <laughs> after 13 years as a, as a senior associate in some of the largest law firms in London. It must be a good time to have a career change. <laughs> exactly, I think yeah. a lot of things started, but, uh, my clients, a lot of them actually started their business in around 2012. Oh, really? yes, 2012. The moons must be aligned. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was doing I was doing um, illustration, and I you know, was doing pottery as a night class, and I really enjoyed it. And then a friend was doing a craft fair. Um, oh gosh, what was it called? A renegade craft fair at Brick Lane in London. Right. And she, it was quite expensive, so she said, "Do you want to share a table and uh-huh. make some more ceramics?" So. I thought, well, may as well give it a go, a bit of extra money, made an extra batch, was hoping I would sell a few, and it went really well, I think I was the only ceramicist there, and sold loads, had loads of people taking photographs, and then from that... 2012? Yeah, I think it's 2012. Were you already making the lovely... um, No, I hadn't, I wasn't selling them, yeah, I was, yeah, pots with faces on, sort of smaller ones, um, some bigger ones, okay. and, um, but I wasn't selling them, I didn't have a shop, and then after that someone who took a photograph and uh, she wrote about a blog post on it, and awesome. then it got picked up by other blogs, and then Design Sponge um, did a post about me, and then it just went crazy, so I had to open the shop. Yeah. Awesome. I, I think, was in 2011? I think it was 2012, 2012. not very good with dates, but oh. I think I was... It just happened that ceramics was really getting popular then. Everyone, you know, it's massive now. You see it everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Um, and also plants were becoming to get, become a thing. I mean, in 2012, it was really hard to buy a plant unless you went to a garden centre. And now there's plant shops everywhere. I don't, I don't Every shop has plants. Because I live in West, uh, North West London. Mm-hmm. And we've always been quite... Um, quite, uh, uh, you know, lucky and having a home yeah. base not too far, yeah. or some yeah. gift and nurseries in, uh, in Maida Vale, but perhaps, yeah, when you are in East London, yeah. probably it's more difficult to find a florist and or also, a good garden centre. yeah, center. some garden centres wouldn't have that many house plants, they would have a lot of garden plants, and um. not necessarily many house plants, where now, okay. house plants are just everywhere, you can get them anywhere, so I think that was, the, f- the craft fairs I used to do, I used to sell the the plants in the pots and you bought the whole thing so I think it was a really nice thing to buy and there just wasn't anyone doing anything like that now yeah yeah so um yeah so so would you mind just talking us through your trajectory as I understand that uh, and as you just mentioned you wrote uh, kiddies books uh, and uh, illustrated kiddies book before working on your ceramics business full-time 
So yeah. who, who were you uh, working for in the uh, publishing industry? Yeah, so I um, did a degree in graphic design at Derby University and then quite soon after, um, through a friend, I got a contact of um, the art director at Usborne Publishing, which is based in Clerkenwell in London, and started doing a little bit of freelance work for them whilst I was working as a graphic designer in Derby. Then um, they asked if I wanted to do more work for them and potentially move to London to work full time, okay. which I had, at the time I had no intention of moving to London. It was a bit scary, but <laughs> I kind of went for it and uh, went down and met them and then ended up working full time for Usborne Publishing in-house for 14 years. But you, um, were you still actually a consultant or were you on the, uh, on the payroll? On the payroll. Okay. Um, and I started off um, doing a lot of in-house illustrations okay. and then um, ended up sort of managing other people as well as illustrating in-house. So I ended up working on two separate series of books, um, okay. which were really good and I really enjoyed that job, which was why I think it was hard to, to, to leave that completely in order to pursue the ceramics full time. Mm -hmm. Although you just mentioned before the podcast um, started that you still do three or four books for, yeah, for it's very hard young to, children. Yeah. Toddlers. Um, is that still for the same uh, publishing house? Yes, same yeah, I've always worked for Usborne. I've done okay. a couple of things for Korean publishers and various other publishers, but mainly for Usborne because I love them so much and, uh, you know, they gave me my start and they're a great company. So, yeah, I do about four or five baby books a year and I think if you look at my baby books, you can see the faces... Like all the flowers have faces, the sun has a face, okay. all the animals have faces. So I think you can see a slight link to my ceramics. And I think that's how I feel. And I think a lot of people say to me that because I'm not a classically trained ceramicist, my ceramics are almost like I'm illustrating in the clay. Yeah. Because I'm coming at it from an illustration point of view rather than coming at it as a kind of trained ceramicist. So... I think I think a lot of people are doing that now. I think a lot of illustrators are moving into clay and make you know. Really? But yeah, I think a lot now. But again, I think in th 2012, I you know there wasn't that many people doing it. So um, yeah, I think I just lucked out and got in there. First. Beginner's luck, you know. Yeah. When you went to that, that's that's trade yeah. market and yeah. uh, everything went uh, like uh, yeah. like uh, hot cakes. That's yeah. Like beginner's luck, fantastic. Yeah. Um, when you design or when you designed uh, those uh, those kiddies books, uh, were you doing that on the software on the, on or were you doing this by hand? Um, a variety, really. Okay. Um, when I first started working there, we used to work on a lot of make and do books, so a lot of crafts and activities. So we um, would, um, you know, anything from collage to paper. Um, you know, painting, thumb printing, making masks, it could be anything, and we would make the products and, and photograph them for make and do books. And then um, a lot of the baby books that I work on now are all done in il the Illustrator program, Adobe Illustrator, Adobe on Illustrator. the computer. Yeah. yeah. It's funny what you said about lots of um, uh, uh, people like yourself who are uh, uh, trained as, as designers mm -hmm. and then they evolve from. Um, the more uh, intangible world, like working on Adobe Illustrator, yeah. or uh, and then on to actually doing yeah. manual things with their hands. Yeah. My designer, who actually designed the logo of um, of uh, uh, my law firm Crefovi and the whole stationery of Crefovi, mm -hmm. so the whole corporate identity yeah. of Crefovi, five or six years after. And it was really, uh, you know, well known in the in the field because I actually um, uh, found his details on a book which I bought at Monocle um, Boutique oh, yeah, yeah. about all corporate yeah. identity, and I saw that book very often also at the Palais de Tokyo uh, um, um, uh, bookshop. And so it was very well known in his trade, and it was also I think, a teaching uh, in Berlin at a Berlin uh, a designer course there in university. And he just decided to actually completely stop his business and instead renovate houses. Oh, and wow. Like, <laughs> Oh girl, what are you doing? So, um, so yeah, perhaps, and he said, I'm tired of working yeah. on screens all the time. I want to be able yeah. to do things with my hand. I was like, this, <laughs> this is crazy, but yeah. uh, good luck. Yeah, yeah. And then I found another designer. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so you also went through the same phase and decided yeah. also after 14 years, if I remember well, in yeah. the illustration industry, yeah. to also use your hands more. Because hey, ceramics is 
at the end of it, it's quite a dirty job, yeah. right? You really have to yeah, dirty yeah, your yeah. hands. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, the result is outstanding. But when I did po- the podcast with Claude Aiello, you know, and also I visit his ateliers workshop in yeah. Paris very often because I'm one, one of his clients. Yeah. I buy quite a lot of yeah. ceramics from him. And yeah, as you know, it's, it's, it's quite a dirty business. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think also as well, when you... Illustration was amazing, but when you work for a publishing company that has to sell you know, to, to various companies that you you can be restricted. So you might come up with a design, but then you have to change it to make okay. it sellable. Right. Um, whereas when you have your own business, like with making ceramics, I can do exactly what I want and yes. I don't have anyone else telling me that, you know, you need to make that green or you need to, you know, make the, the eyes look a bit funny. Mm. So I think for me, it was having complete control was a really good thing. And and, you know, people will email me now and say, oh, I've just seen a pot that you, that's on Pinterest that you made like three years ago. Can you make one of those? And, you know, I'll be like, no, I don't want to make that anymore. You know, I, I want to make these, yeah. you know, so I can but keep changing it very quickly. And if I'm bored with something, then yeah. I just won't do that anymore. Fair enough. Good. And it's, it's I think the fact that you're doing limited series yeah. means that you're I keep myself really interested as well, that, but yeah. also for your legacy, you know, yeah. because probably your items will become collectible. Yeah, as you think, you yeah, know, in, you know, in the next few years. So if you make limited series and also yeah. you refuse to make copies of stuff yeah, that uh, exactly. clients ask. Then it means that it's more rare, yeah. and therefore, in due course, it will become more soft after. I'm yeah. sure we've got some collectors out there. Yeah, <laughs> already have three. I know, actually, maybe more because I bought two at 2021, 20, and then no, I probably have like five or six already at home. Really? Yeah. Well, there's one guy, Justin, who I think has about. 30 to 40 pieces. Oh, I can't even remember. Yeah. I, I've where, got, is, where is he based? He's in the UK, yeah. But like yeah. in London? Uh, I think he's just outside in the home counties. Do you know, it's interesting because whenever I look at your uh, at your little planters and pots and stuff, it just makes me happy inside. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of people say that. It just <laughs> makes them smile. Exactly. You know, and they make me smile after seven <laughs> years of making them. Right. They still make me smile. And yeah. I still make one and I'm like, oh my God, I really like that one. I have to keep that one. Or... <laughs> Good if you could just don't have to sell on that. I know. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so I, I read an article on the tele on the telegraph on the telegraph. Not joking. On the <laughs> telegraph, um, where you explain how basically the fact that you had this dual um, activity and yeah. hence dual income yeah, yeah. for from yeah. what, what from 2012 to probably 2014 or yeah, I think it was 2014. Yeah, I left yeah. us born. Yeah, yeah. That allowed you to actually climb on the property ladder. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How did this come about? This article? Were you were you mate with the the, the te- te- Telegraph uh, journalist? Or um, how did you? It was. Reach out? Or how did you meet her? I think it was that my friend's husband works in PR and they uh, needed someone um, to to write a piece about that kind of lifestyle about people who had done a hobby in order to kind of like get extra money right. and he thought of me and suggested me and then they contacted me about it um, that's, because that's yeah those two years were good because I managed to save a lot of money in those two years but fantastic. I don't think I went out or barely I would literally make all my stuff at home and like buy it all that like, every night I would come home from Asbourne and work on the pots every weekend it was quite intense I think it wasn't until it finished that you realized that having a studio in your own home can really restrict your kind of life um so now here once I moved to Brighton um so what property did I move by the way why, why did you decide to come here as opposed to I tried to buy a property in London about oh, in Morthamstow um right. I tried to buy one um I think twice and it fell through and so it just became it was when Morthamstow prices suddenly went through the roof uh, where is what, what North London, London. North London, okay. Uh, well, oh, is that E17, so it's North East. Frankly, yeah, I think you are perhaps better off here because you know, yeah. it's not too far from the town centre. Yeah. I mean, E17 is quite far from... Yeah, it's on the... It's sort of towards commuting. near Tottenham, so it's at the, yeah, sort of on the yeah. um, blue line. I can't remember which one that is. But, um, uh, isn't that it's the, on the Victoria line. Okay, yeah. right. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, it just got to a point where I'd gone from looking at a two-bedroom garden flat to being able to afford a one-bedroom flat with no garden because the price okay. is just... They were going up a £1,000 a week. It was getting, you know, ridiculous. That was in around 2014. I think it was, yeah, about then. Okay. Um, 
So then I had friends in Brighton and they said, well, why don't you come down here and just have a look? Yeah. So I booked a couple of viewings at Flats and saw one I really liked and ah. just put an offer in. It's but, funny how things in your life yeah. happen like this by, by chance. If I get, if I have time to think about it, I overthink it and will rule it out. So for me, <laughs> I need things to happen just where I, it, the choice gets taken away from me. So I put this offer in on this flat thinking, I think I put in asking price, but because, the, you know, in London I put offers on way over asking price and hadn't got really? them. Really? Yeah. And it, oh, it, it, it fell through all of them? So. Yeah, twice. Oh, you got guessed. Yeah, 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 twice. So I put an offer in this flat and asking price thinking, oh, there's no way I'm going to get that. And then they rang me on the Monday. I think they asked for more money and I said I hadn't got any. Yeah. And then on the Monday they said... Um, uh, yeah, you, you've got the flat, so... Yeah, um, probably the demand here is a bit less than that. Yeah. It's more offer than demand. Yeah, that's, and I think I was the thing. first-time buyer, so I think I was in a good position. Yeah, yeah. So, right, no change, you mean. Yeah, yeah. so I think, um, because it happened so quickly, um, I was just like, I think I rang my mum on the Monday, and was like, looks like I'm moving to Brighton. <laughs> At this point in time, so that was in 2014, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so, yeah. And, and have you, had, had you already give, handed over your resignation to... No, to so I had very, I had intentions to commute, so I'd... Oh my gosh, yeah. commuting from Brighton yeah. to London every day? Yeah, so I tried it for, I think I did it for two months... <gasps> every day then I spoke to my art director and went down to three days a week and worked from home must have been exhausting though one yeah it's just if the trains work if they're on time then it's fine um you're much better off from now right yeah just having to walk to your yeah studio, yeah it's so working. much nicer now yeah. yeah so I think it got I think that happens in June or July and I think by Christmas I'd handed in my resignation and realised that... Christmas, um, December 2015. Yeah, I think it was. I'm terrible okay. at remembering dates. Okay. Um, so yeah, I think I lasted about sort of five or six months and then just yeah, realised yeah, it wasn't right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just too much yeah and then I think I left and actually left in the May um, the following year. Okay, um, well, you, could, you could quite some time yeah, before, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's like 14 years. Yeah, but I think I, I can't um, remember now. But I think I went down to like two days a week yeah. and was just not doing it. But you were actually working from home. Oh no, right, two days a week where you would dedicate yourself to yeah. the uh, illustration yeah. business. Yeah, so I just because I mean, you know, I just sit on my own illustrating, so a lot yeah. of the time it wasn't, you know, I could do that from home. Right, very nice. Um, yes. But they would like me in the office because I was also like managing other people's As work. You were saying, yeah. um, and yeah. the other three days a week you were working on your ceramics on your pots. Um, so yeah, sure. yes, I think so, because then I found a small studio, a shared studio in Brighton, so I was working from there, and I did that for about a year, and then I got my studio about two okay. or three years ago. Well, let's, if you, if you wouldn't mind, let, let, let's talk about that, because um, yeah. I saw a few pictures, um, uh, yeah, just for for, for for you guys uh, uh, who are listening to the podcast, I attempted to <laughs> visit Stella <laughs> at her um a studio around two months ago because I woke up on a Saturday morning and thought, oh, it would be so nice to actually meet the lady who makes all these beautiful <laughs> pots. And um, I think because I'm registered on your newsletter, I must have received, you know, my subconscious must have worked during the night and I, I probably had received a, a newsletter from Stella uh, with new wares, her new uh, her latest um, uh, batch of fantastic pots. And I was like, oh, yeah. It, the weather is starting to be nice. Let's let's go. But then I went to I attended my yoga class and then I arrived too late because Stella had to <laughs> yeah, go to a birthday yeah. party. So I haven't mis- met visited the, uh, the studio of Stella, no. but I saw some pictures on your website and on the yeah. uh, blog and articles. It seems to be very spacious. You seem to have a particular oven and. Um, I wouldn't call it spacious. It feels quite no. cramped. <laughs> oh, okay. I think what the photographs. Thing? I just choose what to take. <laughs> Why did it feel so cramped? Is it because you've got a lot of stock? Yeah, I think it's quite a slim studio, so it's probably not dissimilar to the room we're in now. But um, Do you think that's not quite large? Um, it's it's probably nice. it's probably a bit slimmer, okay. maybe not as long, probably oh, half. Okay. Okay. And then I have that space where I make all my work, right. and then I have a separate studio above it, which might look Very more spacious, good. and that's where I do all my packaging, all my emails, okay. have all the finished stock. Um, so I, I used to do everything from the kind of smaller studio and it was just getting so that, you know, when you just, your headspace is just so 
crowded that you're having to put away one thing to do another. So I'd have to finish working to then package work. So you decided to hire a to Yeah, space. so I took the one upstairs. And in a way, yeah. that's quite good because that's my kind of clean space. So I just okay. package and I can kind you of relax and do all my admin and yeah. stuff like that. Well, you don't you don't, you don't, don't work, you don't live in those premises. Right, you, no. you have to have your flat. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, yeah no. Well, that's now cool. I've got a house. Um, Fantastic. with my well partner done. in um, Five Ways which is kind of like nice area so you sold the flats that actually yeah, made you move yeah, here yeah. so I was actually about to ask so uh, okay so you moved to Brighton because uh, you had this fantastic real yeah. estate opportunity but now you've actually really established your life here with, with your partner and yeah, at the time yeah. I was single, which I think made the move easy because yeah. it was just me to think about. I had yeah. friends here, good friends, so I decided to make the move. Um, and then since moving here, a lot more of my friends have moved down. And then I met my partner, yeah. Pat, and he um, he was from, from a similar kind of... He had a, a life in London where he worked for an accountancy firm and then moved to okay. uh, Brighton and became a carpenter. So we both kind of just completely... Yeah, so, so similar paths where you actually yeah, sort of kind yeah. of work incorporate wealth to go back yeah. to more crafty. Yeah, exactly. And he had a flat too, so we both sold our flats and we so bought a house cool. together now. And so is he also um, a self? Because you're not a sole trader, you're actually a company owner, you have yeah. your own business now. Yeah. You, I was reading in that article yeah. from the Telegraph that you decided to actually set up a, a proper limited. A yeah. company, uh, a private company limited by shares after one or two years because you. Uh, you understood that this would be a good way to channel your revenues and yeah. pay less less tax, uh, yeah. company tax. At yeah. a, I think the rate is 19% at the moment, yeah. so of course compared to yeah. income tax between 20 to 40. Yeah, sort of sense, yeah. yeah because I think uh, as well, because I, I have a lot of sales um, and I also pay for like a lot of postage and things like that. I but, that. Yeah, but yeah, then yeah. also what I'm purchasing, I don't make as many purchases, so it ends up like... It doesn't from the raw material? Yeah, yeah. Why don't you need any more um, I think you've got a lot of stock? Yeah, and I think that, you know, clay goes quite a long way, and I guess, okay. like, you know, so... Um, Do you know, it's interesting, because uh, Claude Ayello, whom I interviewed last uh, December in his uh, a workshop in, in Valoris, he told me that actually the material was sometimes quite expensive, so whenever he was doing some commissions, commission, yeah. uh, uh, you know, work for... Yeah. Uh, for um, these French designers, you would yeah. include this also in yeah. the quotes. Okay, yeah. yeah so, uh, Glazes can be very expensive. Yeah, terracotta. Yeah. I think it works mostly with terracotta. Yeah. And, even sometimes. and also, he told me that he actually um, uh, dislocated his back because wow. he was working in such a big piece for Mathieu Lehaneur. I don't know if you know Mathieu Lehaneur, is really quite prominent mm -hmm. <coughs> a French designer. And um, so, uh, for uh, Issey Miyaki, yeah. the uh, fashion house, yeah. he was making some. Um, um, some buff rate, um, uh, so, so basically some some um, sculptures showing the buff rates statistics of oh, okay. various countries: Japan, France, the US, Mexico. Yeah. And um, it 100 kilos the pieces. Wow. So when he actually um, was lifting it to put it in the oven, yeah. Uh, he, <laughs> so, oh, so yeah, it's, it's, so it can be quite a. Yeah, definitely. I mean. I don't wheel throw work because I get a bad back and it's kind of right. like quite taxing. I think people don't realise when you wheel throw, the people think you're just like la la la, you know, make a pot. But it's actually really you have to really use a lot of muscles in your. It's quite hard to do. It does everything with. Them. How do you call it? Wheel throwing. Oh, yeah. Wheel throwing. Okay. Yeah. It's called, in French, it's called le tour. Uh, wheel yeah. throwing. Yeah. Everything yeah. it does is for wheel throwing. Yeah. Wheel I think you do need to be quite strong um, yeah, to do wheel. that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Which is why a lot of men do wheel throwing. Uh -huh. To be honest, I think. Um, so what happens? So you take a a, 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 a bit of 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 of, of clay. Yeah. Uh, and so you want don't worry with cut terracotta. You use clay yourself. Um, yeah. So we use stoneware. Stoneware. Yeah. Right. Which right. is the sort of like um, stone kind of buff coloured, grey coloured clay. Oh, okay. Whereas the terracotta is the red. It's uh, indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Probably yeah. coming from southern Europe or something. Yeah. Because most of the clay I use is from the UK. Exactly. Yeah. So, so. so it's like what? It's like a uh, pretty. Um, I suppose it's not rigid, right? It's pretty mellow and <laughs> yeah. So it's like a wet, squashy, exactly. It's wet, squashy. Yeah, okay. and then you, you just we roll it. So we yeah. have a clay roller, which is like a massive mangle kind of like rolling pin on a. Okay. So because we used to roll everything by hand, but again, that's quite hard work on okay. your back and on your wrist. Why do you say we? Do you have some? Um, um, yeah, so I have. I have an assistant that comes Wonderful. in and helps me. I was about to ask you whether you had some. Yeah, yeah. Stuff. So it's it's just amazing just to help with all the basics 
basic kind of like start of everything. So rolling of the clay, making the basic shapes, and then I stamp and finish all the parts. How interesting! Um, so, so when you so you, you roll it, how how thick it usually is? The so you roll a, a large sheet, which would be um, you know like kind of. 80 by 40 sheet of clay which would probably be about half a centimetre thick okay um, and then we roll those sheets and let them dry a bit and uh -huh. then we have um, moulds of um, tubular moulds which we mould ah. mold each piece design around um, they have various cardboard tubes that we've collected okay. or we have made some like um, plaster mould pieces to use excellent um, so they all get made into sort of basic sizes of, of kind of pot like this, yeah, to make the right. shape. Uh -huh. Then uh, it needs to be left and dried for a bit. So then we um, need to sponge it, usually yeah. overnight, overnight. Um, okay. loosely wrapped. Okay. Then we like sponge it to make it nice and clean and neat. And then it would have like legs added on it or arms added on it or joining pieces together to make, you know, ears. And would you do all the little finishing details? Which yeah, so I do. Yeah, I do all that, and I do all the faces because it's amazing okay. how um, if someone else does the face and the eyes are just slightly too far apart or slightly higher or the nose, it can completely change the look of them, and yeah. they don't look like mine. So okay. I finish every single one and just check everything that is you know right. Make all the stamps quality control yeah oh yes then, that's right there are some yeah, yeah yeah and then um i glaze them all as well myself glazing means like putting the varnish yeah so what, what happens is, that is after, after you put them in the oven or before yeah so we make the piece yeah. with, with the wet clay and then it has to be dried till it's completely bone dry till there's no water in it so it has to be dried for it could be a few days or right. if the kiln is on it obviously makes things dry a lot quicker cause what's the really kiln sorry the kiln is the oven Ah, uh, okay. So it's like within pottery terms, it's called a kiln. Kiln. And um, how do you spell that? K I L N. K I L N. Yeah. Is that sort of oven. Is that? The yeah. So it's just oh, one of those, okay. you know, mass, effectively a massive oven that fires oh, up so to in the, in the, in degrees. In the pottery uh, world, you don't call it an oven. You call it no, a kiln. Yeah, call it a kiln. Yeah. Ah, thank you. Okay. Yeah. So they, um, we dry them out completely, then they go in the kiln for its first firing, which is called a bisque firing, Okay. and that gets fired up to a thousand degrees, and all the water evaporates from the clay, and it shrinks a tiny bit, so whatever you make, it won't end up that size, it'll end up smaller, so it shrinks a little bit, That's and it. then it comes out like a... Um, it's still quite fragile but at least you can kind of like give it a bit of a knock where when it's dry clay it's so fragile you know you could easily break it so then at this stage it's called bisque bisque wear and um it's kind of like a goes like a buffy color and then at that point is when you glaze it so if i want to do the spots or the rainbows yeah i apply um like a wax um to the spots wow. or the oh, rainbow nice. shapes and the noses and then it gets hand glazed with brushing on glaze and anywhere the wax is the glaze won't touch okay so it ends up with like holes in the glaze and the wax probably uh, will that melts on the second firing yeah so then it gets fired yeah. again to 1200 uh, degrees and you um, so you, you you were saying you do that glazing yourself yes i do okay. all the glazing myself and then okay. sometimes if it has gold on that's the third firing so then after it comes out with oh, yes, shiny the shiny glaze yeah gold. so nice oh, as the gold third yeah so that's the third firing so these pieces must be more expensive yeah. right because yeah and the gold luster that gets painted on it is really expensive it's like 30 pounds for a tiny little vial of pot of about five milligrams or something like that it's is really it the colour gold or it's got real gold in, in it is it yeah precious. I've got a yeah. very precious uh, yeah. <laughs> oh yes that's the one I bought at the unlimited shop in yeah. Brighton when I in March yeah, but yeah, when yeah. I couldn't see your studio but you uh, addressed me to your friend yeah. and, uh, and and dealer uh, yeah uh, yeah um, oh right, interesting. Yeah, so it's quite a long process. You can't, you don't really it's make. Very beautiful. But. Yeah, you don't make one pot at a time. That's why you do batches because yeah, everything needs to be dried slowly and then you know glazed in different stages. So that's why people call it batch ceramics when you're okay. making things in batches. Well, I mean, sure, you can't do 
I mean, perhaps if it were commissioned, you would make it one piece. Yeah, Otherwise, yeah, it's just you know, time-wise, it's just easier to, be, to perhaps make. Perhaps not mass-produced, obviously, but at least, you know, with, like, limited series. Of yeah, or often, even if you're doing a one-off, you do it whilst you're doing another one-off, uh, or, you know, you're doing three or four at a time, even though when they're created, they're actually all different. So, thank you so much for explaining, but would you say that this stone, you said it was called stoneware, yes? Yeah. So, would you say, for example, that the very established players in the industry, such as Wedgwood, um, or even France, la, 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 la Cité de la Céramique, you know, the, of Sèvres, yeah. uh, do they also use stoneware? Is it the same process? I think a lot of those use porcelain. Ah, porcelain. Yeah, okay. which also is a Wedgwood? higher firing. Ah, yeah. Okay, okay. And it's so... It, so it's terracotta, stoneware, and also porcelain. Okay. Yeah, um, they're the main three. Okay. Um, that that you use. You can also get like a paper clay, which is very light, and then you can get white. So there's basically earthenware clay, which terracotta falls under, mm -hmm. and that's quite porous. But you can get a white earthenware, so it doesn't have to be terracotta. So that's earthenware. Then you get stoneware which is often grey. So is that made out of uh, stone which is being grinded and then the, the, it's, it's just... No, uh, it's still clay that's found. Okay. I don't know why it's called stoneware or... Right. Uh, it's just wear. clay. But yeah, they, it's they act differently, yeah. It's collected from the, from the earth. Yes, yeah, and then it's processed you know in some way. In the UK? So I was buying a clay called Staffordshire, Staffordshire. Um, clay, so that must have been Staffordshire, and okay. now I'm using a clay which is called Wessex, mix and Wessex um, is above London I see I'm not very good at my geography but right. somewhere I think it's above London sort of Norfolk area I think so basically what prompted your choice to actually go for st for stoneware is because it was uh, freely of, like easily available in the um, country so they, they, re they act differently so okay. earthenware is more porous which is like with terracotta and earthenware which is why you often see it in as garden pots ah. Um, it's more breathable, and it, okay. and, and you often f often um, fire earthenware and terracotta to a lower temperature, which means you use different glazes on it because glazes react differently at different temperatures. So if you're firing to, you know, twelve hundred you can use different glazes that are very brightly coloured. So often terracotta will have quite brightly coloured glazes, but the higher you fire, the colour disappears from the glazes sometimes. Okay. And they kind of get sort of... I like them more. It's kind of a bit more... What, the in, terracotta? The, the glazes on the stoneware. Right. Um, but often the colours aren't quite as bright. I mean, glazing with itself is, is an art form. You know, people spend years uh, learning what glaze recipes. Um, and even when you have a glaze recipe, like the new blue glaze I've been using, depending where it is in the kiln and how much other things are in the kiln will determine whether it gets matter or shinier, even though they're all the same, they can come out completely different. Just because of the temperature in the kiln yeah. that they've been exposed to. Yeah, because if there's more things in the kiln, the, the, the temperature will stay hotter, where if there's less in the kiln, it will cool it quicker and will the glaze will react differently. So it's a whole minefield of like you think you've got the perfect glaze and then right. the next time you do it it's different. <laughs> yeah. Well it's not the only parameter. There are also yeah. the temperature in the kiln, the can yeah. use the, the glaze. And so all this process, uh, sorry, all, all this know-how uh, in relation to the proper ceramic trade. Did you learn this when you were doing that um, that that course in London? Uh, yeah, uh, I learned quite a lot there. But I think when it wasn't until I got my own kiln when you can really okay. experiment yourself. Okay, on think, a day-to-day -day basis, yeah, doing, doing it. Yeah, I right. think that's the thing. You just need to experiment. You need to try things out and make mistakes and learn from your mistakes because you know you can read a book. But a bit like I said, with the variants that are there, you just need to try it. And I think like you know, reading a book and experimenting. Yeah, well, and every yeah, kiln is different uh, as yeah. well. You can't uh -huh. just you know. How much does what you, one one kiln kiln can cost? I mean, is, they is, cost about starting around two and a half thousand up to about four thousand, depending on the kind of size. Yeah. Well, this is something you can amortize. 
for your accounting. Yeah. So, but uh, okay, it's quite an yeah. investment, though. Yeah. Yeah. Worth, worth your investment. For sure. Yeah. Just for some of our listeners who might be interested, um, if you if you would recommend it, do you mind just kindly telling the name of uh, this 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 uh, place where you learn how to become a ceramist? If oh, you think that. Yeah, I don't think it's open anymore, which okay. is such a shame. But it was Finsbury Park it's College. Right. Um, oh, College is, is near Finsbury Park Station and, and okay. they do a lot of courses and they right. had an amazing ceramics department with okay. such great did tutors. Is it closed down? I heard it was, when I left London I heard that it was being closed down so oh. I don't know whether it actually did get closed. Okay. But wow. I really hope it didn't because, I mean, I would highly recommend it. Okay. They do evening classes um, and then they did like a drop-in. So once you'd done a class and you knew what you were doing, yeah. you could just do like a drop-in Monday and just use the facilities. Wow. So it was really, really good um, but I know they do do good co courses at like City Lit College oh, yes, in yes, London okay. mm -hmm. and you know most towns have a have a good yeah. sort well, of pottery course you to definitely make the most of uh, this uh, yeah. sort of adult uh, learning yeah. classes that yeah, yeah. Uh, definitely yeah. Yeah. maximise the whole thing. I loved it the people there were great as well okay. you know to bounce ideas off yeah. and that's the trouble now I can be a bit solitary on my own you know working on my own it's nice to well I'm sure your team is going to expand yeah. so you would be able to pass yeah. on the well train. that's why it's nice to do pop-ups as well because you yeah. get feedback from so right. I've just made a, a dish which is like in the shape of a hand Okay. and I've made it in my studio and I was just like I like it but I didn't quite know what people would think of it I was like I'm not sure yeah, it's quite different from what you yeah my work. boyfriend was like oh it's not really like in the keeping of your other work because mm -hmm. it doesn't have a face on it but oh, I, I bought it here yeah and everybody <laughs> has been like it's, it's amazing and it's sold <laughs> so that's a good sign congratulations good, yeah. for you. good for you um sorry um oh yes I was wondering so your the output of your work is exquisite for sure. Uh, you you have a very uh, solid uh, uh, distribution channel through Etsy, mm -hmm. two hundred fifty four five stars review on Etsy. That's fantastic. One of my other clients as well make um, stuffed toys. She's got a big big part of her uh, revenues uh, uh, coming from the yeah. her Etsy Etsy shop. Uh, you also have, obviously have your own. Uh, website yeah. um, Stella uh, Atelier Stella Ceramics yeah. dot com or dot, 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 dot com, dot com yeah. for, way, so which is an e-commerce website which is also really really cutely designed and and, um, and efficient um, I see that you are being being sold also in um, very um, highly regarded design stores such as um, 2021 yeah. which is my favorite uh, yeah. design store in in in, in London. Um, but do you uh, want and do you need to also go to um, uh, professional trade shows such as Maison et Objet and also Top Drawer in London uh, to meet some potential distributors, agents, wholesale clients? Yeah, I have thought about it quite a lot, but I think at the moment... Um, I feel that I wouldn't be able to make enough pots to fulfill a huge amount of orders um, and I don't want to become a factory I don't no. want to become I'm churning them out I like the idea that they're changing you know I do a collection then I move on to a new collection mm -hmm. and that there are plenty of one-offs to be had um, that they're more art pieces I think mm -hmm. I, you know, it's really good to have a few wholesale outlets like 2021. I also showed in um, the V&A Museum last year. Oh, so. On 2021, you need to actually tell them off because there is a website and there is a link to your to potentially your website. So it's oh, actually, it? but the link is dead. Ah, yeah, yes, so you need to tell them off okay, because I you will. need to uh, sure. they update that URL link, please. Because yeah. it's not it's not linking to my uh, uh, right. my, my, my website. So. Yeah, oh, I'll well, <laughs> definitely let them know that. So you've got 2021. Sorry, you mentioned another name. Um, so in the last summer, I did um a, a three month stint at the V and A uh, museum I shop. I saw that. Yeah, and I wasn't great. a member yet, and then I was thinking about it. And I was like, ah, oh, and then whoop, we're all back. Yeah. Did, did it sell that? Sell, sell yeah, out? it was really good. Yeah, yeah it sold good. a lot, and I think you should, um, you should, if I may. You should definitely renew that deal with the, the, the v and if it's possible, because it really stood out. It yeah. really stood out from the other pieces. Well, um, I spoke to them, and we're doing, I uh, probably can't talk about it too much, but okay. I'm doing a little collaboration with them, which will be yeah. at Christmas. Lovely. Um, so, yeah, Good there'll quality. be some pieces that I've made specifically for them. Oh, 
oh. uh, with them. So that'll be a really nice collaboration. Then. Yeah, yeah. So that's really good. So yeah, they, they are outstanding. I like to focus member. on things like that. You know, like one-off pieces, yeah. one-off things with with you know really high-regarded shops, rather than doing trade shows where I feel that I would just but then end you have up to have like a fantastic distribution base all over the world. So, I mean, people come from I think all over the world to um, uh, Maison et Objet. And yeah, but I think I would need to find um, a way of producing yeah, them through you know like a small factory in yeah. the UK or something like that. It's not something that me and my assistant could do. All yeah. on our own, and um, you know. Don't you think that you may perhaps you would be able to actually train some some people to uh, to to work with you? I mean, if you look, for example, at um, um, contemporary artists such as the Jeff Koons and yeah. uh, Murakami, um, what's his name? Uh, yeah, Murakami, the, the Japanese. Um, artist, I mean, these guys seldom yeah. <laughs> touch. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, they yeah. don't make their yeah. own art. Yeah. They have like teams yeah. of, of atelier. When I was actually in Chelsea district in in, in New York, I actually <laughs> bumped into some guys who were having a fag at the exit of the factory. I said, Is that Jeff Koons? Because I was, uh, <laughs> or I said, Murak Murakami, that Murakami workshop? I said, uh, Close. It's actually Jeff Koons. I was like baffled, and so yeah, yeah, just yeah. I've got an army of uh, of um, um, assistants who yeah. are doing any signs off nonetheless, you know. Yeah. And um, actually, I was reading, I was just reading my like three hundred emails which are in my inbox, <laughs> and I was on the train from uh, Brighton, you know. So I was trying to uh, uh, to catch up, and um, Jeff Koons uh, rabbit uh, sculpture has mm -hmm. been sold at at the auction just uh, this week for ninety million dollars. So my point <laughs> is, it's not because. His assistants are making yeah, yeah, his work, yeah. but his work is just going, yeah, you know, um, yeah. down in terms of value. Uh, in terms of value, not yeah. at all. So I think that perhaps if you, sorry to say yeah. bluntly, but if you want to get rich, <laughs> it might be a good approach. I think, if I may, your um, your pieces are adorable, and uh, really, you you really have here a gold mine. Honestly, you you do have a gold mine. But the problem, perhaps, for you to expand is in the distribution network. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and perhaps um, as well as still becoming the creative director, it would be also a good um, idea to also develop the entrepreneurial and the business. Uh, approach to your to your to your venture yeah. so that you can really you know start to I ripping think, the ripping what you saw in yeah, terms of uh, yeah I think that's what I find as a hard balance because I started the company um, to be creative you know to be making which, which you are. things and then I find that more and more I have to yeah. you know do so much more of the just running and the managing sure. and I think I get to a certain point and then I get a bit stressed out and then I kind of shut it down a bit again and I because okay. I just want to kind of do the nice little easy making of nice things bit okay. but so I think I just need to have a really big think of like how big I do want to get mm. or whether I want to keep it as a, a you know more of a one-off pieces do you it's have tricky. an agent someone who represents you no I find that quite hard actually with finding someone that's ceramic based I mean I haven't hugely looked but well, I mean, you know, in his time, um, Picasso did a lot of uh, ceramics. Where yeah. Actually, potters were in, based in Valoris. Yeah. Yes. With, yeah. Uh, who, 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 which, which, which is the capital, the ceramics capital yeah. in France, uh, and where uh, Claude Yellow, this uh, potter I was yeah. referring to, is based. So, um, my point is that by making ceramics, you can definitely yeah. make art. Yeah. But I think, and, and of course, uh, where he was helped is that he had a lot of dealers, he had a lot of agents, yeah. so he didn't really. Have, he only had to focus on the creative side. Yeah. So yeah, may, maybe yeah. It's interesting yeah, well. I mean, I have started saying yes to more galleries and sort of like wholesale. There's um, uh, there's one in Belgium now. I've just sent some work to a new concept store in Nice. So I'm kind which, of which slightly. Was, it's called Beau Concept. Book in Nice, yeah. Know it's based? Because I'm actually, I have a flat. I in think it's my quite family, so new, so oh. I'm not sure okay. the address. I, How interesting! So, so they are representing you down there. Yeah, so okay. I think that's good. And she ordered quite a lot of work. So, um, well, next time I go, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely yeah, yeah, yeah. Book set. I yeah. think I heard about this place. Yeah, yeah okay, it's quite new. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's it's good to. Like you said, to kind of keep spreading the word and mm. but, but being quite picky about where I choose, sure. and I think the trouble with yeah, the trouble sure. with doing a trade show is that I would be you know I don't want to be inundated with orders 
to places that maybe I don't want my work in. <laughs> no, no, of course, of course, of course. It's a tricky one because you have to try and, yeah. you know, keep it high end, but then you don't want to be too selective Yeah. because you want to have a good... I think, yeah, now what... I, mean, I think the expansion could be also to perhaps, you know, go on up several continents. Yeah. Right? Because um, you were representing the UK yeah. for 2021 and the VNA yeah. exposure as well, which I understand is going to be renewed in, yeah. uh, in December. But uh, perhaps other countries uh, from yeah. Europe, but also the US, uh, could be uh, could uh, could uh, benefit from your wonderful pods. Yeah. So, so whole, I think this is perhaps... Uh, w- way would be useful to, to work on the distribution, uh, yeah. a selective distribution yeah. network that you could put in place because um, your pieces are exquisite. The creati- creativity and the beautiful, uh, the b- beauty of such pieces is undisputable. But now it's how can you make it? How, how can you grow it to scale? Yeah, how can you, you know, yeah. Yeah, scale it up. Scale, yeah. yeah. But um, I'm sure in due course you'll uh, pass through a business partner or is yeah. it like a, as I was saying, a representative, an agent, or, yeah. or someone who joins the business as a with a, a you know a business or yeah. I think focus. that's what I mean sometimes. I think you know it'd be nice that I'm just left to the creativity and that I have someone that is yeah who's yeah. kind of like on the phone and dealing with all the right stuff that I just kind of get stressed out and yeah. then yeah then fair enough bury my head in the sand but aha <laughs> uh-huh. never a good option no. and what is fantastic is today with all the logistics that you have through um, uh, w- w- if I may ask which do you use a particular delivery company DHL or um, um, in the UK I tend to use Royal Mail Parcel for the Royal okay, okay. yeah um, and I also at do least they, these people they don't leave your, uh, your, 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 your your package to the neighbour and then yeah. they will nix it which happened yeah. to me recently with uh, something <laughs> really? I did for Amazon yeah I was like never received it <laughs> no I always send sign for yeah exactly. like, you know I always tra- tra- I mean so you have, when then I, you have to go and get it from a post yeah, office but yeah, this is safe you, you know, know where it is yeah, exactly. um, when I started doing it I was quite worried about adding the amount of postage particularly I get a lot of orders in the US there you go yeah See, bang. and yeah. you know sometimes it's 20 pounds postage yeah, for a pot that's 28 and <laughs> it's like Ooh. But, but people will pay it they will yeah yeah. Because they know they can't find it anywhere yeah. in a shopping room. Yeah, yeah I think enough. that's the thing. You know. oh, and don't they order like five or six pieces? So that it makes Some sense? people do, yeah. Do yeah. But then I've had people before buy, you know, pay as much postage for the, the, the pieces. That's but it's interesting. Yeah. Well, I mean, frankly, there's nothing you can do about it. Because I've exactly. got lots of clients who are in the US, have their yeah. business in the US, and they also, like, they do earrings, like, yeah. you know, um, custom, custom jewelry yeah. earrings. And yeah, exactly. When a client wants their uh, VV's custom jewelry from New York, yeah. uh, they will have to pay like yeah. sometimes even thirty to f- yeah. forty dollars. Yeah, we get tax as well. Yeah, New York yeah, city yeah. tax. Yeah, but I'm not surprised that you you also have a big clientele in the US. I'm not yeah. surprised. What could be you good is if you find, manage to find a um, uh, a distributor or an agent in the US, yeah. and then you know through yeah. Uh, yeah, and then he or she uh, yeah. Anyway, there's, I'm sure this is where perhaps the um, yeah. The interesting strategy to scale up your business could come from. Yeah, because I think the trouble with sending big amounts to the US is just the postage cost that then yeah. that needs to be added on to the, you know, the yeah, wholesale price. Yeah, but if you make a big batch, okay, and you sell it to your um, distributor in the US, wherever he or she is yeah. based, probably there will be uh, less um, um, uh, 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 custom mm-hmm. uh, and taxes to pay because it would be a big yeah. batch and also it would be business to business yeah. so probably there will be you know some tax looks and, yeah. and custom, custom duties that you can use and then through uh, that big batch being sent and then yeah. distributing the US just um, uh, sells it retail yeah. and then it gives you uh, yeah I mean usually then you have to see whether you wanted to do it on a consignment basis yeah. or you know, the distributor buy. usually distributors they actually buy the whole stock right okay. yeah so you yeah. get a lot of you know a, yeah. a lot of big well, one-off payment yeah. it's good for your cash you know cash flow and um, and then it's very business to actually yeah. you know distribute the only thing is that you have to be careful that um they follow your Choose recommendations the right in terms of yeah. prices and also prices. Right, you yeah. Know, that you don't find it like uh, for five five dollars on yeah. Amazon and stuff like yeah. that. But there's a, there's a lot of things that you can actually put into your distribution agreement to make mm-hmm. sure that there will be some objective quality criteria in terms of how you set up the yeah. um, selective distribution network. So therefore, you can incentivize the distributor to uh, sell your products in, yeah. in, in a way which is um, uh, basically, uh, 
in a way which complies with your requirements in right. terms of the aura of luxury yeah. and premium yeah. that you want to. Because that is something that we also discussed on uh, when we exchanged on the internet for emails, is that at the moment you are seeing a lot of cheap copies yeah. of your work. I was at, as I told you, I was at yeah. Kew Gardens, lovely Kew Gardens, um, last weekend, and I was surprised to see in their shop yeah. some really shitty, excuse my French, yeah. copies of, uh, uh, so, so of little pots with like a yeah. nose and two eyes. Um, so it was it was very basic, but yeah, it's it's like cheap copies of, yeah. of your of your of your wares, and uh, um, I understand it's becoming a problem. Yes, yeah, I think I mean I noticed the copies started probably about four years ago. And are you one um, percent sure that it's copies of your work? Yes, because there's no way. Nobody else was doing what you were no, doing before. No, right? I think it's the, the, the mixture of the face and the shape and, and the, 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 pr the stamping around the bottom. They've even used like a triangle, a line, a dot and a square, which is what I do. <laughs> and I can tell by the shape of the face which photograph that they've copied from I Pinterest. Um, and, you know, and I think I've counted 15 companies now copying me. Um, off for off off the record. Uh, once we finished, uh, we yeah. can talk about this as yeah. well because frankly, I think there's a lot of uh, room for improvement here. Yeah. Uh, but off the record, I, I think, think the trouble is I've just ignored it, and well, then it's got worse. Yeah, it's yeah. A but um, yeah, yeah, we'll we'll come back to this yeah. after. Yeah. Um, um, oh yes, so if I if I may, um, in the 2021 GPL about you and your presentation <laughs> of your of your where it says that you you are being influenced by Swedish, Italian and Cornish pottery from the 50s and the 60s. Would you please expand on this? Because yeah. that seems to be so specific. I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to know more about that. So when I was at the night course college in London before I'd even, you know, I was just doing this as a hobby, yeah. I always used to like look on eBay for vintage pottery and I used to really like the Bjorn Windblad um, like ceramic head and like okay. base, like lady vases. They're kind of Bjorn Windblad. Bjorn Windblad, yeah. Swedish I don't know if I'm guy. pronouncing that right. Yeah, <laughs> Bjorn no Vin Vindblad, probably. Okay. And uh, they're kind of um, like a like a kind of chalice shape with a head and it's um it's god what's it called um I can't remember the term now it's not like mine at all it's very different but it was basically like head pots with faces on okay. that you would put plants in but it yeah, was the Italians do that as well yeah. yeah and I think I took that as an inspiration because I kept trying to buy them on eBay but I always would miss the you know they were too expensive right. I couldn't so, so it's very collectible now right yeah very it's collectible, collectible. Yeah. Um, but it's it's not it's not pottery it's kind of more like a ceramic shape that's made and then um, painted on the you know painted the face and the detail is oh, painted yes. on to the white so. ceramics yeah um, i think yours i mean i'm speaking referring to the italian uh, uh yeah so it's, I think the italian I think thing is Bitossi. Have you seen Bitossi? So it's a very bl bright blue um, pots, and they stamp into the pots. Okay. So I think I took the stamping from the Bitossi okay. that I really liked, and then I took the faces from the Bjorn Windblad, oh. and then I took the style of making with the very like rustic um, clay and the kind of like a muted glazes from a lot of the Cornish potters like Troika that were doing kind so of cool. quite yeah yeah, and they were doing a lot of. Um, uh, quite rustic um, geometric shapes and like brown glazes um, and sort of textural glazes so I think those are my three separate influences that I mangled together to create the work I have now so what was it Sven Bjorn Vindblad Bjorn Vindblad Bittossi Bittossi and the and Cornish then, potters yeah I mean there's a variety of okay. different Cornish sort of small pottery studios from the 60s so yeah, I think you know, I, they, um, and then also I always like Japanese, the kind of yeah, like yeah. stylish oh, yes. zen of yes. the Japanese pottery with it's a true, beautiful true, like ikebana. Yeah, um, so I think that influenced me as well. So I took taken you know a little bit from everyone and created my own style. And it's funny how you can see all these Japanese uh, shops actually, uh, you know. 
popping up in, mm. in London, in Paris, and also online with, as you were saying, all these uh, beautiful, very minimalistic yeah. ceramics. Um, sometimes even like mi miniature mm. ceramics mm. being uh, being sold on on this of this. Uh, yeah, have you been uh, to Eclectic Sixty Six on? Um, God, I'm brain not working. Kings, not Kings Road. Um, in Mayfair somewhere. Okay, no, I have not. Okay. There's one in Marie Le Bon which sells a lot of Japanese jewelry yeah, on okay. Marie Le bon High Street. Maybe it is Marlon shop. Maybe it is Marlon High Street. Okay. There's also another one which is called Native and Co, which is in um, Lovely. It doesn't only yeah. do uh, ceramics but a lot of Japanese um, uh, products in. Um, Oh, uh, where they have this uh, market on Saturdays in uh, mm -hmm. Nottingham. Uh, in Nottingham, where I went and I bought a few yeah. things. And also, I'm a member of the Tate Modern, and the Tate Modern, they have a lot of uh, wonderful selection in one of their shops, and they have a lot of these Japanese miniature uh, 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 stonework. Yeah. Sto yeah, like. Uh, Stoneware and, yeah. uh, and, and I, I love it, and I bought the fruit from, yeah. from there. Yeah, I, you should look up elect, elect eclectic sixty six. It's yeah. only Japanese ceramics, so they have a lot of like visiting exhibitions okay. from various Japanese potters and okay. really nice little. And it's true that there is. We can see the influence in what you do because it's always straight to the point, you know, yeah. your designs and with no fluffy unnecessary stuff. And <laughs> yeah. I quite like. No, but I like yeah. this aesthetics, which is. In a way, yeah, quite minimalistic. Yeah, I think, you know, my taste at home is quite mid-century and yeah, quite right. minimal, so I think that reflects in... Mid-century from the 20th? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, like, 15, you so... Eclectic 66. And you said it was Mayfair. It's either Mayfair, it might be Barlow Oh, yeah. I, I wonder whether it's not that one now. I'm talking about, yeah. I'll, che I'll, I'll, I'll check it. I'll yeah. follow up with you on that. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So thanks for clarifying this thing, because it was like, mm, I wonder what a mix of Cornish, Italian and Swedish <laughs> pottery <laughs> refers to exactly. So now I know, thank you. <laughs> um, right, so how, um, if I may, how do you see the, um, the business expanding now? Because uh, you definitely have like golden goose here, mm. and you know, I'm saying this with <laughs> all due respect, you know, no, but seriously, these things are yeah. so like hotcakes every time I go on the website. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, this one is already gone. <laughs> sold out, sold out, sold out. Why, by the way, do you keep the ones which are sold out on your website? Because uh, then I might be, I might add another okay. one like another later. Batch. Yeah, right. Yeah, and when, then sometimes I take them off. I see. And when you do a batch of one particular SUK product, mm -hmm. is it a uh, ten? Or twenty, or just an addition of how many? It depends on the design. The the small like mini pots and the you know I probably do a batch of. 10 to 14 but then the big lady vases or the kind of more intricate ones or the ball vases probably only like three or four at a time i see um okay so yeah. 20 uh, you said sorry about 14 14 the smaller ones and for those for the yeah. bigger ones three to four yeah well that makes sense yeah perhaps it's uh, yeah and so what how do you see the business evolving um, I don't know, sometimes I kind of, I know, I do, do you know what, sometimes I feel like I'm so busy just holding it together that I don't even have time to like think about the future or time the next thing. Time to business plan, <laughs> no, it's never, five years. Because I had no idea it would be like this, you know, yeah, I just thought I was going to make some pots and then I had no idea I would end up with, you know, effectively you know designs that are like influencing other companies and kind of people yeah. being, you know, buying them from all over the world. So really, do you have some like retail customers from all over the world? Yeah. Where are they from, for example? So, so you mentioned the US. Yeah, I say obviously the UK is my biggest client sure. base. Then I say next is is um, the US. Uh huh. I did used to have get a lot of orders from Australia, but I haven't had as Ooh. many lately, right. so I'm not quite sure about that. Um, I have quite a lot from. Um, the Scandinavian countries. Oh, I'm not surprised. Yeah, this is, this is actually a fantastic homage yeah. and recognition because these guys from Scandinavia have got such high tech. Yeah. So it means that you know, as I was yeah. saying, I get like, quite a few like Iceland and Norway. Yeah. Um, they, they a lot from Amsterdam, um, from the Netherlands, particularly. Okay. Amsterdam, I get a lot of orders from there. Wow. Yeah, quite a few France, um, okay. uh, Belgium, quite a few. I say the countries I don't get many orders from is Spain. I don't get many Spanish customers. Okay. A few Italians. Maybe they have yeah, I think yeah, it's just taste, stuff. doesn't it? A different taste. Oh, all right, okay. Mm -hmm. I get quite a few from Russia. Russia. Korea. Mm -hmm. Korea. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, South Korea. Um, 
you, so, so for, for the South Koreans have got exquisite yeah. taste as well, and the Japanese, my God, yeah. Yeah, not so many. I've had a few to Japan, but not not too many to Japan or but China. I think it's probably because they already have. Yeah, they have a lot of it's sort a, of similar. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. What's called. Yeah, so it's quite interesting to see when you look at the logistics on the website where, um, you know, which are your best customers. Yeah, that, 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 this is good data. Yeah, Brazil, I get quite a few from Brazil, Brazil yeah. This is actually quite good data, you know, yeah. if one day you want to draft your business plan as yeah. to where you should, you know, where you should expand mm. in terms of your distribution mm. channel in which particular zones. Yeah. That's that's interesting. So, so you don't really have a plan in terms of... No plan, just to, I think, because of the copies and because um, I think I do want to to focus on making some bigger pieces and some art pieces and okay that's as far as I've got really <laughs> so no plan no <laughs> but can you leave out of it some bigger pieces that you make only three or four per batch I mean is that something which is yeah I think as long as I'm making them alongside other the pieces right. um then that's fine yeah I've, I've got I've got some ideas and some suggestions yeah, I mean, on how you could, I don't you know. could protect I mean, so, your yeah. products, but because uh, sometimes I suddenly think, oh, I'm going to go and do an MA in craft and do some woodwork, and I just suddenly think like it's I'm going to do something else. A millionaire, oh, God, you know, it's oh, not God. like I'm making, making another yeah. MA. It's, I'm going, <laughs> <laughs> you know, going for, to study for another MA that you don't need further no, studying. No, no. No. But then, but then I also think that's about what I say to my clients. You know, <laughs> who's actually really well, well on the way to become a millionaire yeah. out of her stuffed toys. And you know, so do you when do you want to do your make? Do you, do you want to make your first million? Of course yeah. you do. So just listen to me. <laughs> I know, but then I do. She's very reasonable, that and she's got yeah. a very good business mind. But I'm saying is that you don't need yeah. further studying. That's it. You've done all the study. But then sometimes I think when I kind of boil it down to like what makes me happy. Yeah, you okay. know what I mean. Then I kind of suddenly then think, okay, well, it's just the nice, creative right. making, and maybe the business side is the bit that really stresses me out. Because I, um, I don't know that that you know, I'm a creative person. I'm yeah. a maker. I'm not a business head. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is something that can be yeah. easily developed as well, because yeah. also you feel quite in control when you are so able to talk about this, you know, to to basically be on top of these things, yeah. as opposed to as you were saying before, yeah. burying your head in the. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and that's what I like about Dana, my other client, uh, yeah. uh, my, 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 my client who is in doing all these stuffed toys. She's doing all the, um, you know, she's doing all the prototypes yeah. of the of her stuffed toys. Yeah. But also, um, she, yes, yeah, she, she, you know, she, she, she has the business head and business yeah. mind as well. Her dad is also an entrepreneur and also some yeah, of the Yeah, I think that's the thing, isn't it? If you've got like a family background where <laughs> my parents are probably worse than me, I think, you know, they're just kind of never pushed themselves, yeah. just kind of stayed within what they were doing. Probably like think, employed in the company. And yeah, my dad not, stayed at the same place for years, yeah, exactly, yeah. you know. I, I come from the same family Yeah, my mum kind of just was a mum and did some yeah, floristry right. and, you know, but... So. But you can be different. Yeah, I'm trying to break the You are different. <laughs> <laughs> um... um yeah, and also I wanted to congratulate you on your PR coverage, like press and, and you know, and communication coverage. It's fantastic because you really have some fu uh, really good, <laughs> honest, you really have some good know. articles <laughs> and, and blog posts yeah. about your, your product and this article from the Telegraph. It's, it's yeah. quite well spotted. You also seem to have a good mind to actually speak the, the, the good people to actually write to or dedicate time to in terms of your communication strategy. So it's really spot on. Okay, that's yeah, good because I don't feel like I have what a strategy. <laughs> I feel that things well, come maybe to you the just end. follow your intuition, but it's yeah. spot on. Yeah. 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 That's that's, uh, that's 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 those were the questions yeah. I wanted to. Okay. <laughs> so thank you so much, Stella. Thank you, you. Is there anything else you would like to add? No, I don't think so. It's been it's been good. It's good to talk it through because it makes you say things out loud and, Does it? and yeah well, and glad. remember so. so thank you so much for listening to um, uh, Stella Bagot and uh, and uh, myself um, if you're interested in checking out the wonderful exquisite um, um, pieces made by Stella you can go on atelier um, stellaceramics.com and um, uh, you will have a feast for your eyes <laughs> and your senses thank you so much bye bye Thank you for listening to our podcast, Lawfully Creative, produced by Crefervy Studios. Subscribe to our podcast or catch up with our original shows on iTunes, Spotify, Deezer, Stitcher, YouTube, Anchor, and many more podcast aggregators and platforms. Please leave a review and rating about our podcast to encourage others to discover our curated content. Thank you.